This is just an excerpt from a full episode. If you enjoyed what you hear here, go check out other full episodes, either on YouTube or as part of the podcast feed. Enjoy. Sticking with the government, we will be heading over to Wasteful Government Spending News now and Minister for Government Services and man still surprisingly in his job, Stuart Robert, has been discovered as having defrauded the government of $37 million by naming his parents as the head of Robert's Family Trust. Literally, this is the plot of the little-known Australian TV show Back in Very Small Business, and that guy is a tax-dodging, crooked businessman. A very weird choice to try and make a relatable character out of, but hey, we've connected with worse. It's been known for two years, and there has been no consequences. Robodebt was implemented in mid-2016, at which point the Centrelink intervention rate was 20,000 a year, but immediately jumped to 20,000 a week, almost as many as there are upcoming Marvel film announcements before the coronavirus put a stop to all life except for Disneyland. Mr. Robert claims he resigned his directorships and offloaded his shares in IT service businesses GMT Group in 2010, three years after he was elected to parliament. He told the newspaper he structured his affairs in a way that did not breach the constitution, but did not provide any evidence to support his claim. A particularly hypocritical thing for a man who has been forcing thousands of Australia's poorest citizens to scrounge through pay slips to provide evidence that they don't owe Centrelink money. In his estimation, the burden of proof was on them. This is what is known as the Gervais defence. Alan Roberts said he was unaware he had been appointed director and company secretary and his wife a director of Robert International Pty Ltd between 2010 and 2016. He said, no. We haven't run it, no. Robert International was run by our son. I mean, don't you hate it when you haven't briefed your parents on their role in a national scandal and they blow the lid off the whole thing? Like, maybe if you'd cut them in on some of that sweet, sweet government funding, they might have learned to keep their mouth shut. I mean, I thought being big-time criminals was all about family. It's all about the family. But we are a family. Because a man that doesn't spend time with his family can never be a real man. It means you belong to a family and a crew. I don't have friends. I got family. I mean, this is not his first misuse of public funds. Here, he spent $38,000 on the internet. I don't mean like building the internet, just paying for internet bills. Like, what's going on there? Are you just exclusively paying for phone data? Or maybe you're paying for the phone data of a small village. Is this why the Centrelink website crashed? Because you don't know how the internet works? Mate, I spend $60 a month and my internet is unlimited. In 2018, Robert said, there is a small segment of the community who still think it is okay to cheat the system. What he failed to mention was that most of them were politicians. Now, what I love about this is this is one of those stirring public statements from a politician that not only will be quoted over the ages, but has aged very well. Here he is having charged the taxpayers $2,000 to attend a Hillsong gathering. Here he is being caught breaching ministerial standards over donation links. And here is his Fadden Forum, a fundraising arm of the Queensland Liberal National Party and first draft name of an all white collar Sinister Six being used to secretly bankroll two candidates to the tune of $60,000 to run in the March 2016 Gold Coast City Council election. And here he is using exhibitors at a purported non-political seniors expo run by the then assistant treasurer Stuart Robert as a fundraising source by charging them $300,000 $300,000 in fees, which went straight into the Liberal National Party's campaign account. A totally normal and not at all suspicious place to put your spare cash. But hey, the buck doesn't stop here, so to speak. Current Australian PM and seemingly man with a giant hole in his wallet, Scott Morrison, had spent $3 million in travel expenses and accommodation, and that was before COVID hit. 
No wonder they're so hard on people getting more than they should, even by as little as $100. There will be no money left for them to take for themselves. They'll have to fabricate some more sports grants or something. These guys are just the Bluth family, but with more repugnant personalities and less jokes. You don't have the money, Pop. All his money in the sports grants. It does explain why Morrison was reluctant to spend so much money on support for the Australian people in the midst of a pandemic. If you're going to receive government funding, you at least need to be sneaky about it. You can't just have it handed to you. And recently, three South Australian ministers had to step down. Well, I don't know if they had to, because let's be honest, this doesn't seem to have impacted Stuart Roberts' ability to hold a job where he gets to decide whether poor people get government money or not. But I am glad that they did. It makes us feel like there's a tiny bit of accountability, which is immediately suspicious, because it probably means that they are sitting on a Cthulhu-sized secret out there in Adelaide. But hey, it's a start. And as such, we will be using some sort of robo-debt system to scrape this money back. Maybe we set up an allowance based on position and pay. The more you get paid, the less you can claim. I think that seems fair. And we appoint a council of citizens who have been on Centrelink for a while now. They can be trained by your harshest Centrelink employees to be ruthless and uncompromising in getting back any overspending. We are out here creating jobs. I mean, this sort of thing is probably why Scott Morrison is struggling so much with the idea of the future of the economy with regard to the coronavirus supplements. How will we ever have enough money to pay for the poor people slacking and pay for political overreach and manipulation of public funds. Seems we've hit the intersection of when an immovable class divide meets an unstoppable greed. If only we had a class of super wealthy citizens with more money than they knew what to do with, maybe with enough to support the GDP of a small country. And as they are donating their money, it could be written off as some sort of philanthropic tax deduction. <sighs> Unfortunately, such people don't exist. They never have. Oh well. Back to the toil then. I believe you all have jobs to do in the middle of this pandemic. We wouldn't want the economy to suffer after all.